This is Talk Easy. I'm Sam Fragoso. Welcome to the show. Amelia, hi. Hi. How are you feeling? Good. I'm worried because I've got to put my my cup down. It's going to make a noise. It's okay. This is like very far from a chicken shop. It, yeah, it's true. But this is a, a, a coffee tea date kind okay, of thing. Something right. like that. It's okay. a date. I'll cheers to that. Cheers. Um, I said I wanted to go on a date. Did you? When I was in LA. So, <laughs> is this the only? This is this is this is what I'm. This is all I'm going to get. So that's okay. <laughs> I'm so sorry. Yeah, that's all right. I, I'll do my best. Yeah, same. <laughs> <laughs> well, well, thumbs up for me. Why haven't you gone on a date here? I've tried. I've been trying. Really? Yeah. Who have you been trying? Just people. I got some people. You have some people? Sure. Okay, you can set me up. This is what I wanted. I think I want to be set up with someone. Okay. Type? Um, Type. Intelligent. Funny. Oh, no. Okay. Yeah, I don't have okay, that. Okay, right. Um, I have a couple. Yeah, I have a couple. Okay, great. We'll talk about it after. Thank you. Um, how are you feeling? <laughs> I'm feeling good. I'm feeling good. I came to LA on Wednesday and I've been fighting the jet lag pretty well, I would say. Um, although yesterday I don't drink caffeine and mm. yesterday I was feeling kind of tired. So I had an iced coffee, Yeah. Um, which I've kind of maybe only had one ever in my life. And it made me go insane in a bad way. And what does that look like? I don't know what it looked like. I don't want to know what it looked like. But what it felt like <laughs> was that I was high on drugs. <laughs> right. And very anxious and what wanting it to end. What did you do high on drugs? Oh, I went to see Kate Ballant's show and that was amazing. And she is incredible and I love her. And so that was good. But I just felt, I don't know, I just felt very anxious the whole time. It was fun. And it was at the Largo, which I went to once before. And uh, it's really cool there. I like it. It's a great place. I love going to see comedy. It's my, one of my favorite things to do. I, I feel like you could do a live show there. That would, think? Be that would be great. I don't know. I think that would be a very different muscle to exercise. But mm. um, yeah, maybe in the future if I want a new challenge, which I kind of always do. So yeah, never say never. But let me ask you, how do you feel about being interviewed? Um, I actually like being interviewed in a way. Um, I don't mind being interviewed. Okay. I, I sometimes I feel like this need or want to like articulate myself or I want to tell people the story of Chicken Shop Day or what I do. I, I sometimes feel like people have a very specific idea of me based on um, Chicken Shop Day yes. and they see certain clips on TikTok and they don't they don't know the real me but like I feel like um it's kind of in my head I've been figuring out like oh, how much I actually care about people knowing the real me and sometimes I'm very much like yes people need to know exactly who I am mm -hmm. and then I'm then I think actually even if I do try and show people exactly who I am they'll never really know because they're actually not friends with me so well we're gonna try okay yeah <laughs> we're gonna try mm -hmm. people do primarily know you from clips of the show mm -hmm. you recently had um, Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds on. True. Um, do you believe in polyamory? <laughs> do I believe in polyamory? I believe in it, sure, each to their own. I have... <laughs> for yourself. For me? Yeah. Um, I'm trying to just get with one person right, right now. I feel like let's just go with that. Let's do one. Let's just get one person. In Los Angeles. In Los Angeles. And then we can try more than one. Right. So I'm just dying... Um, at the, at the basics. Really. So I'm really kind of jumping ahead there. Yeah, you're jumping ahead. But I've never... That's because I have faith in you. ...tried it. Thank you for that. I've never tried it, but that's definitely what um, I was doing with Hugh and Ryan. Right. And they were 100% into it. If you're going to start... If you're going to start to do it, they're a pretty good place to start. I know. It's downhill from here. Growing up in Northwest London, mm -hmm. your parents were together, but they weren't married, right? Yeah, they were together... Yeah, have been together for 40 years, and then... Um, they got decided to get married. Kind of, I think, maybe because of me. I don't I don't know. I feel like I had something to do with it. I spoke to my parents. I realized I'd never asked them why they'd never got married. Mm -hmm. And my mum said, well, first of all, she's obsessed with Joni Mitchell. And Joni Mitchell has a song where she says that you don't need to get married. It's just a piece of paper from City Hall. And I think my mum just listened to Joni on that one. Yeah. You're named after a Joni Mitchell a song. Joni Mitchell song, yeah. <laughs> Good, you do research. Um, it's called Amelia. Um, it's called, yeah, um, spoiler, it's called Amelia. And then about she, the pilot, about the pilot, it's true. It's, a, I think it might be about the pilot, it is, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. Um, so she spoke about Joni Mitchell, and then she also said, 
And also your dad's never asked me. So, so, so I took that and ran with it mm-hmm. straight to my dad. I said, dad, uh, I've just uh, been aware. I've just been made aware of some information. Mm-hmm. Um, apparently, uh, the reason why you're not married to mom is because you've never asked her. And then he said, what? I don't think that's true. Um, <laughs> like, maybe I haven't, but I didn't think she wanted to. And all these um, these things I can't fully remember. And then uh, that Valentine's Day, he asked her to marry her. Did them not being married, did that matter? Like, how did you think of love and relationships as a kid. Hmm, interesting. Yeah, I don't feel like it did matter. If anything, I thought that was kind of cool yeah. that they weren't married because you don't have to get married um, uh, if you don't if you don't want to or if, if you do want to, you don't have to get married. I feel like it's a, fa- a faff, like, really, because mm-hmm. then you could get divorced, all that stuff, the paperwork. So your dad listened to you? My dad listened to me. And he proposed? And, and he proposed. And then me and my sister were the bridesmaid at the wedding. That's incredible. Mm-hmm. So you did have something to do with it? Uh, yeah, I, I did. It may not have happened without you. No, no way. Um, I'm Cupid, basically. Yeah. Is that how you see yourself? No, not really. I wish I actually set more people up than I do. Um, but uh, only my parents. But maybe that's good enough. That I'm apparently going to have to do that for you after yeah, this. Yeah, absolutely. So can we just go back to Northwest London, where you grow up? The show Chicken Shop 8 is turning, I think, 10 years old this year. Mm-hmm. And you're right. Like People don't totally understand the story of it. I don't think they know how it came to be and how you came to be. So I want to talk about that. You grew up across the street from the Edge Railroad Station. Is that right? Edge Railroad Station. You live on the fourth floor (laughs) of a double glazed apartment. Yep. Which I didn't didn't even know what that meant until doing research today. Did you like go on Google Maps and find out? Like, were you zooming in? I actually have it for you right here. Is that that what happened? (laughs) (laughs) Your mother was a librarian. Mm -hmm. Your father, uh, a councilman, as part of the Labor Party, still is, I Mm -hmm. think. Um, When you went to school, how did you introduce yourself? I'm Amelia and I'm going to be the editor of Vogue one day. That's how I would introduce myself. Why did you want to do that? I always wanted to work in fashion magazines um, or maybe like magazines more broadly. I just I grew up reading them and it always just looked so glamorous, um, the lifestyle of of um, working in a magazine and um, being able to be around models, fashion designers, um, like important people within culture. And mm. um, that life um, really seemed like a dream to me. Um as someone also who was always interested in pop culture, um, working for somewhere that curates it, um, felt like that would be really, really fun. And then I also was influenced by watching things like Devil Wears Prada or like Laguna Beach. and um, One of the finest movies. It, exactly. One of my favorite movies. And um, Mary Kate and Ashley as well. TV and movies about women who were basically living, living their dream. And I wanted that too. <laughs> uh, you said once that I blame Mary Kate and Ashley for my ambition as a child. Mm-hmm. Yeah, because they just got to do everything. It was just crazy. They, they not only did they get to travel the world, they got to base, they got to turn their hand at multiple different jobs and skill sets, and they got to kiss loads of hot boys. So to me, that was and wear cute clothes. Yeah. What more could you want? I said the same thing watching them as a kid. <laughs> yeah, and to be a twin as well. So fun. Have you asked um, Mary Kate? And Ashley to come on Chicken Shop Day. No, but I was thinking this the other day that I really should, but they don't do any press. They're very mysterious. They've they're just so interesting to me because they've been able to stay cool and relevant for like their whole lives mm-hmm. and pivot into um being success like extremely successful um designers. Um and I feel like uh, and taken seriously, and I feel like that's hard to do when you are a child star. <laughs> I, I feel like the best way for people to understand who someone was as a kid is to know the things they loved. Mm. And I have here a list of your favorite things on the edge of 10. <laughs> you found that. And I thought maybe you could share it with people. Oh my goodness. Okay. My favorite things. I have made a list of my favorite things. Number one, Mary Kay, Mary Kay and Ashley, Pepsi Max, writing stories, Acting, swimming, king size cozy beds, Sky Plus box, my family, <laughs> Rosemary and Time TV, Cyan Park, London, Disneyland, Manchester United, <laughs> Dolphins, Harrods. <laughs> For the record, you put 
king size beds ahead of your family. I also would like to clarify that I don't think my family is, I'm talking about my actual family. I think I'm talking about a television show that I used to watch called My Family. <laughs> so your family's not even cracking the top 15 my, here. My family is not involved. Um, <laughs> and nor should they be. <laughs> um, yeah, this is, I haven't read that list in ages, but it's so true. Also, like Harrods. I, I feel like I went there once and was in awe with it because it had a pet store in the, on the top floor. Um, and also I was, I never had a, I never had a king size bed. I, I remember every <laughs> single, every single birthday I would say, please, um, please give me, take, let not, I don't want to be in this single bed anymore. Please can I have a king size bed for my birthday? And my parents were obviously like, no, you, we can't even fit, we can barely fit a single bed in your room. So this is really more of a wish list. Yeah, this is actually a wish list. Rather than, I've always been living in a dream world, I feel mm. like. I've been living in a fantasy and I, I think that this actually proves that. Can we talk about one of the dream worlds you created? Um, You were, uh, for your 13th birthday, you threw a 60s and 70s themed birthday party <laughs> where you hired a DJ from the Yellow Pages yeah. while your father manned the bar making mocktails. <laughs> yeah. First question, was one decade not enough for a theme? <laughs> it had to be two. We needed 20 years right. like of the six, nostalgia. The 60s weren't expansive <laughs> enough. We had to do the 70s as well. Oh, God. And it was in a church hall. And I, I made paper invites that I sent, that I gave out in class. And was I, it well I, attended? Not re like not really. There was a, a whole cohort of people that I invited that didn't go because um, they actually went to another girl's house party, which was seemingly cooler. Um, what was her name? Bella Ray. She's actually one of my best friends. Oh. Um, she is one of my best friends now. But back then, she was just someone that I only admired from afar and now she admires you up close exactly exactly but yeah that was um that was a fun birthday we did the conga why 60s and 70s i don't like know. what did you love from that that you wanted to make it a theme i feel like i my i i feel like my parents were quite influential in that. I think that I always... What do you mean? They liked the 60s <laughs> they, and 70s. They, they liked the 60s and 70s. They remembered <laughs> it well. Um, they were alive. They were alive then. I don't know. I think that I grew up <laughs> listening to a lot of 60s and 70s music. My parents only listened to music strictly from the 60s and the right. 70s. And I listened to a lot of Motown growing up mm. um, when I was a child. And I think that Maybe that's got something to do with it, but I don't know. I think maybe I thought it was cool. I also remember that back to Mary Kay and Ashley, which has been a constant theme in this um, conversation. They um, in their film "My Lips Are My Lips Are Sealed" where mm -hmm. they go to Australia, they have a '60s party. I there think. it is. I think that's what it probably was. How were you as a teenager? Like, what were you like in in high school or, or secondary school? Um, secondary school when I started, I didn't really have many friends. Um, I I left what you call as elementary school and I was super popular in elementary school and then as soon as I got to secondary school all of my uh, friends vanished I think I tried to reinvent myself I wanted to start afresh why was there such a dip in, in the friendships well I think I just wanted a clean slate and you got rid of them I maybe got rid of them but then found it very hard to recover <laughs> yeah. and find new friends so I just started from scratch and I found it really difficult to make friends and I kind of the first three years of school I didn't really have many friends maybe like one friend mm. and then um, I made it my goal to get friends did you make friends going to the youth center in in Westbourne where you mm -hmm. started working on that magazine by the, that the point when I was 16 I had a bigger friendship group than I did when I was okay. 12 um, you started conducting interviews there though exactly yeah tell so, what was that like well, it was kind of amazing because I feel like I owe everything to that youth club and that magazine. Um, and it was just such a brilliant thing, an idea to to create a magazine that was for young people, made by young people, um, where you could essentially write about whatever you wanted uh, in terms of pop culture, from music to fashion to um, like TVs and movies. And I made some great friends there. And I also learned a great deal about music. Mm. Why interviews? Mm, 
I don't actually know. I think I've just always been interested in um, speaking with other people. And again, I feel like maybe part of me had ambitions to be on television, like as a presenter or just sort of have my own show in some way. Like I loved also like the Amanda Bynes show growing up. Mm. Um, And I think maybe I just wanted to, I I think I wanted to be listened to and I wanted to be heard. Mm -hmm. And I think um, interviewing people is one way that you can, um, I don't know, uh, be part of the conversation, literally. You were interviewing musicians Mm -hmm. in that time? Yes. How did those print interviews go? Like, how how did you like that format? I enjoyed it. I feel like um, the first set of interviews, um, when they were as a written column, um, I was asking quirky questions like funny questions um not your usual uh in-depth kind of thing they were all just kind of quick fire yeah um like and it, what like if your music was a piece of chicken what would it be mm-hmm. um do, do you get fan mail do you have fans that are male um those kind of things <laughs> like i feel like it's so of the time now and it probably always has been but like that quick fire sort of style didn't seem like that popular like um 12 years ago definitely not so we, i was doing that and it created for like a awkward funny environment and i was also when i would write um up the column i would add in my own sort of thoughts within it that were me attempting to be funny mm-hmm. um I don't know if it really landed, but um, yeah. So I have some of them here. Do you want to look at them? No, you do. Do you actually? No, I don't. Oh, right. Thank God for that. I tried. <laughs> yeah. I bet. I didn't get a response from the uh, the sender. No, they wouldn't. They wouldn't have access to it. I don't know who would, to be honest. I wrote a couple women who were who were editors at the, uh, the Cut, the magazine. And even they didn't? They didn't respond to me. Oh, right. Okay. I said, we had Zadie Smith on and Tom Hanks. They said, oh, we don't care. We don't care. No. No response. Sorry about that. Ego was shattered. Shattered, yeah. I'm in shambles. Yeah, I can see. Was any part of the interest in interviewing to meet boys? Probably. I feel like it. I feel like the date aspect as well. Like it, I chose that, that it, it's not just an interview I'm doing. It's a date. I feel like that's an important part of the right. of the picture. It wasn't. It, it it was more than an interview. It, it it's a date. So um, I feel like I always wanted to also go on a date. At that point, I'd never been on a date. Yeah, you said in some interview, I think it was maybe in Vogue, they asked you about that period and you said um, you said that I had an insecurity about not being desirable. I was the last person at school to have my first kiss. I didn't have a boyfriend until later. And nothing's changed since. No, no kisses? No kisses, no, no, no. I, I saw Matt Healy try. Tried, he tried. Yeah. He failed. Why did you feel undesirable? Because I never got attention from guys growing up. Mm. I feel like it's probably relatable for so many people. Like I was just, people were not interested in talking to me. Um, and why do, you, why do you think that is? Because I wasn't, I don't think that they thought I was conventionally attractive or like their idea of what was attractive. I think that like young boys and boys in general um, have a very specific idea of what is attractive and maybe I didn't fit in that mold or like I feel like people did approach me but then I I didn't find them attractive as Mm -hmm. well so it it sort of what kind of boys would approach you just like ugly ones (laughs) and I'm sorry but I couldn't get down with it um (laughs) you just you couldn't close your eyes and jump i couldn't know i just think again i i live in a fantasy world where i just feel like i have an idea of like what i want and it just doesn't match up a lot of the time and then i just end up being disappointed but really i'm 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 still working on that i need to just get over that but i i don't know i just i just had glasses i had braces i was really small um i i don't know but the the funny thing is i've always thought that i am beautiful like Mm -hmm. i've never not thought that that makes sense yeah i've never not thought that i've always personally been confident in that way and but then it just sometimes i feel like people don't see it within me and i also probably am too preoccupied about like my appearance and why do you feel like you're too preoccupied because i just think that surely it's a waste of my time to be so occupied by um what i look like when Mm. really um there are so many other attributes 
um, to a person that are um, more interesting mm. and like what should be a, a attractiveness should be should be more than just appearance mm -hmm. and when I think about all the people that I've been attracted to in my life it's definitely not just because of the way that they look mm -hmm. but I think again it's just it's just something I I've always felt like this uh like that beauty is currency um for women and I think that that is actually true um, and it's just a thing to try and get your head around. And al also, like, it's bound up in, like, the need for male validation. I'm not trying to blame <laughs> Vogue here. <laughs> but do you think that being the epicenter yeah, maybe. of your world yeah. contributed to some of this? Yeah, probably. That's probably true. I really want to do the Met Gala hosting the red mm. carpet. And maybe that would be a moment. You're to... trying to replace Emma Chamberlain? When Emma's ready to depart, I'll be ready to step in. Do you say that every year right around the Met Gala? <laughs> um, I say it, I've said it actually a lot, just like in general, just to, to people. But um, I, I would love to do that job. <laughs> I would. <laughs> I've heard you say it. Um, yeah. You said I was the last person to have my first kiss. Yeah. How did you know that? Because everyone else is talking about it the whole time. Okay. It's like the most favorite, the, the most favorite thing to talk about. Like I kissed a boy. Okay. It's the number one topic of conversation. So I, I knew that everyone had. How long did it take? I was, I don't know, maybe I was seventeen. No, I was sixteen, maybe. Mm -hmm. Or maybe I was. You, I can't. You, I can't fully remember how old I was. I think you don't I was, remember who it is. No, who, who was it? Well, I mean, sure. The oh, age he was called Noah, and no. he actually denied kissing me. What? Yeah. So this is what happened. I had my first kiss at a house party, and then the next day, obviously, I did what everyone else has been doing and t and told everyone. And then another girl in my class then got up out of her seat and said to everyone. I've actually spoken to Noah and Noah said that he didn't kiss you. So that didn't happen. Where did the discrepancy come into place? Did he just, pre why did he pretend that this didn't happen? See, this is go this goes back to my thing, this whole thing that's in my head that like, I'm not desirable, that you would like have to say it didn't happen. I know, I don't understand that. Yeah, I I don't understand it too. I don't know, there's, there's multiple things that have happened in my like teenage life to do with guys that I feel like have stayed with me and have created this kind of view of myself and I need to rid it from me because I just think the coolest thing and I'm I just whenever I see a, like a woman who like doesn't care about what people think about them and their appearance like oh that's just amazing and mm. I, I I'm often that person but then sometimes I'm not but I think also that's probably just everyone that's terrible that that happened <laughs> like that's yeah, a traumatizing that would do a number on anyone exactly so, so and it's, it's funny those things that that happen to you when you're um, a teenager that stick with you. I think probably most people, everyone probably has something that, um, a story to tell that yeah. they still think about. Today. What I'm trying to say is, Noah, if you're listening. He's a loser. No, I know for a fact that he's a off. loser. Yeah. 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 I'll say it for you. Yeah. Okay, good. Can we go into your childhood trauma now? Yeah, on Chicken Shop Date, <laughs> okay. I'll do it. Okay. That, that's what you guys talk about on there, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah. Um, speaking of, can we watch... Um, a clip from the first episode okay. of, of Chicken Chop Day. We get. What would you say your type is in a girl? Type. Mm -hmm. I like, like girls with a sense of humour. Okay, so I have a laugh, yeah. like, you know. What do you do on weekends? I rave mostly. What's the best rave you've ever been to? There's not a best rave that I've been to, but there's, there's raves that I've been sick. If your music was a type of chicken, yeah. part of the chicken, what would it be? It'd be a fire. <laughs> I've not watched that in so long. I Every time I watch that episode, when, when I have before, I just constantly am looking at my posture. Mm -hmm. I really need to get better posture and I've been working on it. Your posture looks pretty good. Thank you. Ten years later. When you're watching that now, how do you think about it on a creative level? Hmm. Well, it, it's funny because uh, I I feel like the show is very sim. In many ways, it's it's still very similar. Um, but I would say that the editing style is slightly different, and my my confidence has grown. Um, if you watch episodes now, like I talk a lot more, mm -hmm. um, and I I'm I flirt a lot more, um, and I think that's just because I've. 
I've I've become more confident, but I also have grown up like as a person. Um, but yeah, the editing is more like staccato, and also we le- we left just visuals of me like staring blankly. We did that a lot, and the cuts would be quicker. Um, I also just think in general the production value is just so much less. There's a in the corner you can see this terrible logo that I actually designed myself at my university. Um, campus and it's tragic and I I don't think it's just terrible and that there was no I wasn't I was wearing a microphone but my microphone didn't work so the sound is like just only being picked up from Getz's microphone stuff like that I mean it was the beginning yeah no no that but that's what I think when I watch it I think the production value is not as good and um I'm more awkward and young I want to talk about those early years of making the show because Mm -hmm. there's a lot of people listening to this or watching this and they're going, I want to make something and I just don't know how or where mm-hmm. to begin. So you're uploading these videos to YouTube. You're a college student at the time, mm-hmm. right? How much would a video cost to make? So the at the beginning, I guess it was kind of free because I um, got my friends to help me. And then the we- ones you met on a music video. Yeah, so, well, Ma- the the main person is Marvin, who um, I met at the Cut magazine at the, youth, at the youth club. And he also was becoming a video editor, like, as his actual job. Oh. And so he said, okay, I can edit the videos for you. And then he was working at an ad agency at the time as a video editor. And he um, said, we can edit them in the edit suite at the ad agency and then I was a runner on a music video and so I met a camera operator and then he got his friend and so we kind of just all came together which I think is just what happens when you're young and a creative you just make things for free and you get people involved and then the shop we've managed to find a shop that would let us film in there for free Mm -hmm. but he the boss man the owner of the shop I think he thought that we that he could serve customers still, so that's why he agreed. But we we basically blockaded the sh- the shop with yeah. with camera equipment and stuff. So there was a queue outside the shop, and he was really annoyed that the customers couldn't get in. But we were also really happy because we had basically shut down the shop for free. Um, but yeah, so everything was done for free at the beginning until for for like maybe a good five, six episodes Mm -hmm. until it got to a point where I couldn't ask for favors anymore. Um, And then what happened? And then I had a panic and was like, how am I going to do this? And then luckily I got um, a job for Carphone Warehouse, which was, is this sort of phone brand. Mm -hmm. And they paid me 5,000 pounds. And that money then helped me make another, like, some more episodes. So you would get other part-time jobs and then funnel that money into the show. Yeah. But they weren't really part-time jobs. They were more like the beginnings of like social media influencing work. And then luckily I lived at home, so I didn't have to pay rent. At what point does the cost of this become more expensive? The cost has never really been changed. It's never changed? Well, not really. Like, well, it kind of... I guess it has and it hasn't. Like it, they don't. They, they take they. The episodes cost a few thousand pounds to make because we're a very small crew, right? And two camera operators, two camera operators, a sound op, and then my producers, which my my production team, I pay a salary separately. So I guess it does all add up. But um, I also then started making um, money with the views, and once you're getting like millions of views, then you can actually earn a living off YouTube. So the money that I make on the AdSense on YouTube like funds the show. Because you don't do sponsors on the show. No, I don't do any sponsors. Right. I'm just really averse to like anyone being involved apart from me. I don't want a brand to have any say in it. I understand that people who do, but I kind of make my money like elsewhere doing, doing, working with brands, but not on my show. I will do separate work for them. In the first few years, you seem to be focused on grime and rap and, and musicians. Why did you want to focus on them? I guess uh, because that was what the magazine was covering. Like at, when I was at the youth club, like the magazine covered that type of music and everyone who was there, that's the music they were listening to. So that was why. But I, did you think of it as a music show? Um, Not really. I don't even, I don't really think I thought about like talent that deeply. I just, <laughs> I just sort of saw it as, oh, like everyone's listening to this 
um, music and musicians are really popular. Everyone loves music. So I'm going to interview these musicians that everyone's listening to. How did you go about the booking uh, at that time? The magazine will like had some connections to like publicists and managers. Um, and so I got some help through through them. But also this was at a time when like the people that I was interviewing, they weren't like big stars. Right. Um, they were known like within the UK, but they were more accessible essentially. Um, and I feel like um, Chicken Shop Date, like the rise of my show also came at a time when the rise of UK rap, with the rise of UK rap and grime. Definitely. And that's just sort of like those things where it's just pure timing. Um, and I feel um, really grateful to be a part of like um, that time. Because people always... I don't know how, how this goes for you, but I often have people in life come up to me and say, like, how did you get X person on the show? Mm. And they're always looking for, I had a parent who was famous mm. that got me the person, which is just not true. What do you make when people go like, God, she's gotten everyone. Like, how does she do that? I feel like it just takes years. Yeah. Like, there's... It's just that's one of the hardest, been one of the hardest parts of the show is like to book the talent. That's the part I want to talk about, like the years it took. It's y literally years, like yeah. 10 years and plus to like build up a reputation and build up um, an audience. And also like it's also happened in, in different stages. And there's I've also been quite strategic, I think, with the type of people that I get on the show. Sometimes I, I, I will get a certain person because I know that they're friends with another person that I want. And I think, OK, they might see this and then decide to do it. And sometimes that that happens. Or like for me, it was really, really important to get Daniel Kaluuya on mm. the show because... That seemed like a turning point. Yeah, I think there's been like multiple different turning points. But for me, that was a really big one because he was an actor and I hadn't ever had an actor on the show and I think before that people uh, thought oh it's like this is specifically music and maybe it's just specifically rap music and I've always had ambitions to not only cover rap music because it's something that I love and I love the musicians that I've covered but I've I've always wanted to have people of all genres and right. um, of all different like pathways in in the entertainment industry um, so like one of the p people I really wanted from from the very beginning was the documentary maker Louis Theroux because I just loved him and grew up watching his his work and it it took me you know eight years to to get him and that was kind of mainly only because his kids liked the show and told him to do it <laughs> the day you interviewed Louis, He's someone you grew up admiring. Yeah. What did it mean to you? It it just... Do I have that story right also? I, I, yeah, you have that story right. Like when I got off the train and uh, about to interview Louis, I like recorded a video on my phone of me being like, <laughs> Amelia, you're about to go and interview one of your heroes. Like that, just to remember the moment, I think, because I, I think it's really difficult when you're doing things that you've always dreamt of to feel like present. Um, and also... You're, you don't really know, like, how are you meant to feel? Like, it, it's often, like, doesn't feel sometimes, like, that big of, of an emotion or, I don't know, it's confusing sometimes. It's um, very confusing. It's really confusing. And so... I find it very disorienting and I have to keep reminding myself, be present. Yeah, because like, sometimes it doesn't feel that overwhelming. And then you kind of think, oh, is that bad? Like, did I not really want it that much? Like, have I... Um, you just think about it in a negative way, like, oh, I'm I'm so ungrateful and all these kind of things. But mm. it's really hard to know how you're meant to feel sometimes. But so I just recorded that just as a moment. I've never watched it back or anything. I don't even know what I'll ever do with that video. So yeah, it was what it what did it mean to me? It just it felt I was just super I was very happy. I, I always thought that the way that I would meet him would that I'd be at one of his book signings and I'd put my hand up and ask him a question. Um mm. and for me to meet him for the first time on my show, me interviewing him, um, was is really amazing. And then it also birthed this whole jiggle jiggle, which was this viral TikTok sound mm. um that then kind of made us become friends. So it's a kind of amazing story that is one of the things that I never fantasized about and never could have predicted. And that's why it obviously happened. <laughs> and now let's play a bit from that song. <laughs> what is it called? Jiggle Jiggle. Okay, uh, but I know you can rap. That's nice of you to say. Well, I, I mean, I know you have rapped, sorry. <laughs> I, I have rapped in a program I did, a Weird Weekends episode about rap. 
Can you remember any of the rap that you did? My money don't jiggle jiggle, it folds. I'd like to see you wiggle wiggle, for sure. It makes me want to dribble dribble, you know. Riding in my Fiat, you really have to see it. Six feet two in a compact, no slack. But luckily the seats go back, I got a knack to relax in my mind. I'm sipping some red, red wine. Nice. My favorite part is, uh, wait, wait, is it six foot two in a compact, no, no slack? Yeah. Oh, God. Something about that is really, it feels good in the brain. Mm-hmm. I cannot explain mm-hmm. it. You should get Louis on the show. You'd be great. You'd have a great conversation with him. I love that. I love how he's also seemingly excited mm. by the next generation of mm. broadcasters or interviewers or whatever you want to call yourself. Yeah, whoever I am, yeah. Some people, I think, go the opposite direction. Yeah. And, and he seems very excited to like be on your show and to have you on his podcast, which I know you went on. Yeah, and it could go either way, couldn't it? And I think it would have been devastating if it went the other way, that yeah. he was totally not interested. Or the worst case scenario is if like your your hero, your idol, like does not like your work. Yes. <laughs> and you kind of are modeling yourself on them. Not that I'm modeling myself on Louis through, but like he's definitely inspired some of my style. And imagine if he thought it was trash. That yeah. would just be so painful and heartbreaking. I think he likes it. Yeah, no, he he like he loves it. Speaking of yeah, no, he likes it more than his homework. <laughs> yeah. Speaking of comedic influences, can you walk us through how Leslie Nope, Amy Poehler's character from Parks and Rec, and Nathan Fielder, mm-hmm. how have they shaped your approach to doing this kind of anti-interview? And Zach Kalifanakis right, as well. Between two ferns. Be- between two ferns. Um, I guess it's with, well, with Leslie Nope, I guess it's her kind of, um, do I want to call it desperation? No, it's not really, it's not a desperation. It's her, her character, her enthusiasm yeah. um, that it's so charming. Unflappable. Exactly. And she's also a, uh, an underdog, but yeah, her enthusiasm, her enthusiasm through everything. But then um, she's just so silly, and I, I feel like I often would back before uh, I used to get really, really nervous to do Chicken Shop Day episodes, and so I'd play Parks and Recreation like bef- while I was getting ready mm. to like get in the zone and be like, "You can do this, you can do this. You're, you're funny, you're funny." Um, you don't get nervous anymore. I don't get as nervous anymore, no. Um, but I think that's just because I've been doing it for so long. I still, I, I was kind of nervous for the Hugh Jackman and Ryan Reynolds one because uh, they've just been interviewed by so many people for so long within their career that mm-hmm. they just could probably spot like a terrible interview from a mile off. And that kind of was making me nervous. Um, but yeah, so Leslie Nope, her character. Um, and then Nathan Fielder, I guess, his awkwardness and his... Um, he's not scared of an awkward moment and an awkward pause and silence. Not only is he not scared, he is delighted to have them. Yeah, exactly. Also, it seems like when he's interviewing someone, they, they're not worrying that much. He's got this thing about him where he can interview someone and you, as a viewer, you're watching it thinking, how does the person opposite him not think this guy is so strange but for some reason i think they probably think he is so strange yeah but they go i don't care what the strange person thinks about me yeah exactly and maybe that's kind of what i try and do with with my interview style is i become weirder and say strange things and be a bit like um yeah alternative in the way that i'm approaching things and it makes them feel more relaxed Mm mm-hmm yeah, yeah. I, I'm assuming that's how it works for him, and it seems to work for you. Yeah, because they probably think, okay, well, she's so weird, so whatever I say is going to be completely yeah. fine. <laughs> Should I be weirder in this interview? <laughs> in, I think you're being weird enough. Oh, really? Yeah. Sufficiently weird. Sufficiently weird, yeah. Do you think it comes naturally to me? Yeah, yeah absolutely. Very, you're a natural. Great, okay. A natural weirdo. thought we were getting along, but... We are. Oh, okay. Weird's good. Yeah. Okay. Yeah, it is good, don't you think? Yo, totally. Yeah. Uh, not in the JD Vance sense. No, I'm loving this, by the way. The, not, the, not, in the, not in the couch sense. I'm loving the weird thing that's taken off. Yeah. In the US, I think it, it's great. Yeah. I think the words, like the really harsh words, were just not meaning anything anymore. Um, so they had to hit them with the weird. Yeah. Apparently, authoritarianism or uh, the sort of 
nationwide threat or, or, or the global threat to the democracy. Just no one was liking that. Fascist wasn't hitting anymore. Fascist was falling on deaf ears. Weird landing. It, absolutely. The kinds of people you have on, that expands as well. Like You don't just have musicians. You had, like you said, Daniel Kaluuya and, and other really good actors. And, and it seems that you're interested in other kinds of people. As the show keeps growing, my understanding is that you try to sell it to Channel 4 and other places. Is that right? Mm-hmm. And that they don't, they don't go for it. Mm-hmm. Why do you think that is? Two things happened. Back to when we were talking about the finances and not being able to fund it, that was when I tried to sell the idea. And I took it to Channel 4 and they said no. Um, And I took it to the BBC and they said no. And then luckily I then did another commercial job that came in and then I was able to use that money to fund the show. Then I start making more episodes. It gets more popular. And then um, new conversations start happening with buyers again um like on different media platforms um and now content is becoming more of a thing and luckily i didn't decide i got offers at that point and then luckily i didn't decide any that you liked no because they they wanted to own the ip mm. everyone wanted the ip and i wasn't willing to part with it and that was, was there any amount of money that you would have parted with it one media company offered me to own the IP. They offered me five hundred pounds. That was what I. That those were the offers I what was getting. What does that convert to in US currency? Like five hundred dollars. Like it's <laughs> like isn't that how it works? Isn't it the same? Six hundred dollars. Five hundred pounds. Mm. And you said maybe six hundred. I said yeah, five fifty. I left. I left the room. But then I got management, and then. Um, I was able to like make better decisions. I mean, I made a good decision for myself, but um, they so were able to steer me in the right when direction. When was this? I don't know, like eight years ago, maybe. When you were going to maybe sell it? Yeah. So you kept going, you kept making it independent. Mm-hmm. When did the the when did you not have these budgetary concerns? 2018. 2018. So four years. Four years, yeah. Yeah. But like I was, I I feel like I've been relatively lucky. Actually, it's been a ten year journey. But like, you know, I was lucky enough to be like making money while I was um, f- finishing my last year of university. So I don't really feel like I've like struggled in that way at right. all. So you think it, you're lucky? Yeah, I think I'm lucky. Yeah. Do you think you're more lucky than talented? Do you think um, you're more lucky than hardworking? Because it feels like you've put in a lot. I know. I ha- Yeah, I definitely have put in a lot. But I also just think that I've, I'm like a privileged person. I come from, I like, I grew up in London. Like even that in itself, like I think like that the, th- the these things that we're talking about probably would not have happened to me if I didn't live like in central London and I didn't mm-hmm. go to that youth club and like I wasn't able to live at home like while I was studying, like all of these different things. And then I was lucky in a sense that I, was able to even think of an I like the idea, you know. So many right. people. That's the hardest thing is like thinking of the idea, um, and then it just took off in a way. It took off to a point that I could sustain myself, you know. And then I've just been working at getting it more and more popular. It's definitely taken off, and in turn, you've inspired other people to do the kinds of interviews that you're doing, mm. or, or the 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 form of the. The, the anti-interview form, whatever it is. Mm. I'm thinking of like Z-Way or Bobby Altoff. Do you like their work? Do you find like a lineage in what you've done and to what you see from them? I feel like I definitely didn't inspire Z-Way. I think that she's obviously been doing her own things like quite separate to me. I love her. I think she's amazing. <laughs> I um I remember like I, I first found her YouTube videos um back in the day and just thought, wow, this is exactly my kind of stuff. I think she's so good. So good, so brilliant, so intelligent. Um and I'd love to I, I've met her briefly, but I would actually I really would love to get her on my show. Um because I think that'd be a really fun conversation to have. Have you invited her? Yeah, I've invited her, but we have to film in London, so it's really hard. And when she was in London last, I wasn't there, so um, so that didn't work out. But yeah, and then I really loved the um, iteration that she did um, for Showtime. Mm-hmm. I thought that was so cool. And it's so rare that um, online shows are given the opportunity to then go on to like broadcast television mm-hmm. and also like executed in such a great way. Like I really feel like um, it was an, a great graduation 
for her. Um, and it's a shame that it hasn't been continued again. Yeah. Um, so yeah, I just, I loved, love her style. Um, but like content has just become such a different landscape now. Like when I started Chicken Shop Date, like 10 years ago, uh, the algorithms just did not exist in the same way. TikTok didn't exist. Mm. And to go viral, like you could go viral, but it didn't really happen that often. Whereas uh, today in today's climate, like things are going viral every hour um, and we're all seeing the same thing. So what has changed in that? The social media platforms like TikTok being invented and the algorithms becoming really, really smart and creating like echo chambers of of content, things being more shareable, like just literally the in- interface of how social media platforms work, um, that now you can do one interview with someone and it can go viral. You can get thousands and millions of followers and then you have a platform. And mm. then also alongside that, brands are now um, more aware of, of of everything and like uh content creators and so they'll fund things and you can get money to make things and careers can be uh can take off in a way that they didn't used to before i'm actually quite i'm really glad that i didn't go viral with the early episodes of chicken shop date like (laughs) i think that if i put out that episode of gets now Mm -hmm. and it went viral i don't know like what would happen because the like the idea of something going viral, it, by essence, it's like a, f- a fluke. Right. And so then, and it's like the most um, amount of eyeballs you'll get on something and like a crazy amount of hysteria over something. It's so impossible to sustain that mm. um, in the forthcoming um, things that you put out. So I'm really grateful that um, only like a thousand people watched the episode. I, I know one piece of criticism that I, that I've heard um not just about your show but but about the sort of like anti-interview format is what people say is that like people uh musicians artists they're not doing um enough of other people's programs mm-hmm. other other people's like long form shows or something like that and here's a quote from uh, Jamil Hill, who previously worked at ESPN, but now works at The Atlantic. She said, um, I don't find these types of interviews particularly enjoyable or interesting. Instead, it just sadly points to how real hip-hop journalism has been practically erased. Some of the media teams behind these artists aren't interested in them sitting down with credible people who know how to tell stories and do quality interviews. Then they wonder why an artist's real story goes untold, neglected, where that artist is misunderstood. Mm -hmm. What do you make of that? Well, I also, uh, there's lots of things there. I mean, I feel like my show, I would hope, is in a different category to the other ones you've mentioned. Um, And I think that they're very different shows. Um, And I would also say that, I guess in some ways that is true. Like now... um, it's true and it's not true because I also do think that lots of artists do go on shows where they are able to talk about in depth about mm-hmm. their life and their music, but they are probably just not as popular because now, again, people are interested in this kind of clickbait um funny content that just again feeds the algorithm and is just pushed in front of people more so i don't necessarily think they're not doing it but maybe there's just not as much of an appetite for it but then again with my show like i think because i've been doing it for 10 years and that it's always been the point is it's like a comedy show as right. much as it is an interview um i feel like I am doing a lot of research (laughs) um, for every guest that I have on. Um, Most of the questions are based either like a plays on their lyrics or like deep diving into their like, like history as an artist or as a person and I bring specific props that are related Mm. to um, their life. And so I I would say that I I do the research and that um, it's, it shows in the program Uh, as someone who does an obsessive amount of research Mm. to me it's very clear that you put time and Mm. care and like love into those episodes one thing i would say though to that point is that there's always there should be always room for more um 
voices within media, voices from different backgrounds interviewing people, you know, mm. like that's just going to make for more interesting stories and for um, different perspectives to be heard. So, yeah, I would say that there should always be a wide variety of shows that people should go on. But that's also down to publicists as well. Right. <laughs> um, like making sure that their clients are are seen across different platforms. But I also think that there is like such a big landscape now for different formats to be interviewed on. I agree. Look, podcasts. as someone who's been doing this for a long time, I, I understand her point. I think it's, it's less about, frankly, you or anyone doing your kinds mm -hmm. of interviews and more about where media is moving. Because I, I it's like, for example, before President Biden dropped out, the criticism he received, and it's, it's fair, is that he didn't do a lot of press conferences and he did less interviews than any sitting president in the last like mm -hmm. 40 years. He turned down the Super Bowl interview. Now, I have I have a good sense that last year his team came out, came to you, and they were interested in him maybe coming on the show mm. because he, quote, would like the style of your interviewing. <laughs> like, that to me is really funny and kind of strange that a sitting president is like, your style of interviewing, which is really a style of dating, mm -hmm. is something I like. But I think it does speak to where the media and where, uh, where people in power are moving in terms of how they want to be presented in the press. Mm -hmm. I think him coming on Chicken Shop Date would be really fun but I don't think he'd have to defend like his record. No, no, it is it is interesting. Like like the culture and um and the landscape, media landscape has just changed so much. Like something that I was really like surprised by is this uh, move to long form interviews. Like people now watch like two hour long <laughs> interviews with people on YouTube and on podcasts. I mean, like, people are watching this right now. Like, how long is this going to be? Oh, we got like three more hours. Like it's it, to me, that's crazy because my interviews have always been like I cut them down into like five minutes because <laughs> I specifically only want to have like the funniest, funniest moments. So now there's like been a shift. Things are always changing. And again, as well, like with less and less people watching entertainment formats on television mm. and moving towards watching podcasts or watching TikTok shows, um, I feel like uh, when not just a musician, but a president is now looking at their publicity campaign. They are wanting to uh, target specific f people and like maybe um, the most people that they can. And now they will be looking to going on a podcast rather than going on an, on a news show. Mm -hmm. And that's, maybe that's fine. <laughs> yeah. Like, I, I feel like that's okay because this is what happens and things change. And some people take their jobs really seriously and are really good at what they do. Biden may have become president if he did Chicken Shop Date <laughs> instead of 60 Minutes. He would have stopped aging if he <laughs> came on the show. Like, that would have happened. Did and you feel comfortable flirting with the 70-year-old? He's Isn't he, like, 90? <laughs> How old is he? <laughs> I think he's older than 70. He's, like, 78. Is he not in his 80s? 79, I think. Um, Maybe he just turned 80. Yeah, but the thing is, I can... Um, mold myself to each guest like this is what I also try and say when we're trying to book talent mm -hmm. um, uh, I it doesn't have to be doesn't, I don't have to flirt with you we can make it something else like for example with footballers soccer players they for some reason have this aversion to coming on the show because they genuinely think it's a date and that, that their girlfriends are going to be annoyed about going on it so I'm always trying to tell them like guys you can friend zone me immediately and we can make it something we can make it something else. It's because they're worried they're gonna fall in love with me, basically. Right. Well yeah. they may. Yeah, they probably they probably will. Um my last creative question about the show. Yeah. You send them the episode before it goes out. Is that right? Sometimes. What does that depend on? Well, I I I did and then now I don't. When did that change? When I realized other people, my peers, weren't doing it. And I thought, well, what the, what the hell am I? Why am I doing this? Yes. But then, because I feel like it's standard, right, within editorial practice that you don't send the interview out first. I was surprised. Yes. So then, so I was made aware that I was doing something that wasn't standard. So then I thought, hang on a second. <laughs> I'm going to stop sending them the, the 
thing. Um, you should have called me. And now I should have called you. And now I, I am also in a place with the show where if someone says, I'm only doing it if I get to have approval, I'll say, Meh, I don't care, you're not doing the show then. <laughs> Whereas before, I was still trying to build momentum. And if a really amazing person said, I'm only going to do it if I get approval, I would I say yes. However, we word it, we word it in a way where it's it's a courtesy viewing and we'll, we'll only give you amends if it's something's factually in- incorrect mm-hmm. or you find it offensive. Also, like being factually incorrect about flirtation. <laughs> I know, but that's, I got that from like a new, like when I did a news thing and I was like, I'm using that. I'm saying factually incorrect <laughs> or offensive. We're going to go with that. And usually, but to be honest, I never really have amends. I feel like I'm re- okay. I, one thing I feel like I'm good at is knowing what someone will like and mm-hmm. what make how to make someone look good and attractive. I think I love the edit process and we like really fine tune things. And so usually when I send something over, they don't have any feedback. They're like, this is genius. It's weird when you give a look that I've seen on your show. Yeah. On this show. I think it's just my face. That's why also I've one of the reasons why I this has happened to me, this career, is because I just think I have a face where people think that I'm annoyed at them or yeah. something's going on with my face and I don't know I'm doing it. I don't know, like people often, I've got the kind of face where someone will be like, are you okay? I'm like, yeah, I'm having the best time of my life. Or they'll, like uh, sometimes I'll see a video of myself and I'm pulling like a really like unenthusiastic or like ugh face mm. and it, I didn't know that I was doing that. Mm. And I think it's, lent itself to my style (laughs) it's true during this interview i haven't been able to tell throughout how you've been feeling okay there we go i guess we'll never know we'll never know in the beginning we talked about how you're at the 10 year mark of doing this Mm -hmm. do you still like doing it yes i love doing it I like doing it because I have creative control. I think if I didn't have that, then I would find it really tiring. But I was in the edit for the Billie Eilish episode really recently. And I just thought, oh, so great. Like, I'm so happy. This is my job. And and also the Eric Andre episode. Like, I just had a really good run of episodes where I was like, I can't, this is my favorite thing to do is to have like secured an amazing guest, to have written great questions for it to go really well to be sat in the edit and piecing it all together watching it back and thinking this is really good Mm. and people are gonna love this and I can't wait to show people this episode and so yeah I still I still love it you are one of very few people that have um announced their retirement for years and years, <laughs> like I can think of, I'm, th- I'm thinking of like Quentin Tarantino has long said, uh, with this 10th film, he's done. Mm-hmm. You have said, once Drake comes on, mm-hmm. the show is over. Mm-hmm. When you saw the music video or when you first heard Not Like Us. <laughs> what was going through your mind at that point? Were you like, maybe I should have a different last guest? Do you have Kendrick Lamar's contact details? Yeah, I've been I've been saving them not for myself who does this work, but for you yeah. who deserves to interview mm-hmm. him. Mm-hmm. Yeah, there you go. But did that song change uh, your 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 final guest idea? Maybe. The allegations? <laughs> I think it, I I think it would be interesting um to interview Kendrick Lamar, yeah. Wow. <laughs> I think we just made news. I think that's it. No, I don't know. Like, it's, I don't know. When, when when I, even when I said that, I was like, really, do I want that? But also things change, you know? And also he... New information. Maybe he's not interested in me. Comes out. He's not interested in me, maybe. Part of the end of the show, I've heard you say, is about um, this, like, question of falling in love. Mm-hmm. Do you mean that in earnest? Like, do you... <laughs> do you feel like that will be easier to do once you're not fake, real, fake, mostly fake dating people on a YouTube show? Oh, God. I just don't even know at this point. I just, I honestly <laughs> don't even know. <laughs> do you feel like you need an audience to fall in love? Um, No, but sometimes I work, sometimes, honestly, this is where my head goes. Sometimes I just, sometimes I'm just like racking my brains as to like why 
I'm single. And I think it's clearly obviously because it's my, like if I wanted to have a relationship, I could get one. Obviously that's true. But I sometimes think, oh, it's because I have a dating show and and guys think that it's, that it, they're like, it's weird that they'd be going on <laughs> dates. That Or then I'm thinking it's because I'm like become famous or like, it's all just stupid. And actually the reason is because and maybe I don't allow time in my life mm-hmm. to f- fall for someone. Do you find... Uh, it easier to connect with someone if they're coming on the show? No, not really. Not anymore. But then the thing is with the show, sometimes where the lines are blurred, but not really anymore. Like, now I sound, I feel like I sound absolutely crazy. <laughs> um, it's like a crazy person. I'm not trying to make you sound but, crazy. But it's definitely like the the date, I think one of the reasons why it's done so well is because in some way it is authentic. Mm-hmm. And the fact that like, for the majority of creating the show, I actually have been single and on a mission to meet someone, like lends itself maybe to like a, tr- a trueness within it. I also just think, why couldn't I meet someone on the show? Like, right. you know, you like into someone, you hit it off and then you start dating. But I also just know that it's not real. <laughs> I feel like I've just been talking absolute nonsense this whole this whole time. <laughs> <laughs> Where are you going over there? Yes. Is this going well? Yeah. Okay, great. Are you worried? I'm worried that I've just been talking. I don't even know what I've been talking about. <laughs> like, yes, chicken shop date is real. And I'm going to meet the love of my life on the show. You have said all those things on dozens of shows. Yeah, yeah, I know. Why does it suddenly feel different now so no, I just me. feel like I'm just listening to myself back and I just feel like um no I'm being I'm being honest and that's what you can ask for that's that's what we wanted um I heard that in your interviews if there's ever a sincere earnest moment you tend to cut it out, cut it out. yeah well this is talk easy so the last question I have for you God, is it gonna be really yeah sincere? it's gonna have to be a little it's gonna be, sincere. It's gonna be embarrassing as opposed to the rest of this. <sighs> okay, go on. Okay. If you don't mind. Oh, I don't know if I want to go. What is it going to, what are you going to say? Like, what is okay. true love mean to you or something? No, like what are you, <laughs> you no. Know, I'm just thinking the show's at 10 years. Mm-hmm. I don't know. It doesn't, I don't know if you'll be doing this, you know, in 10 more years. All right, sorry. Have some faith in me. No, I feel like you want to do something else. Yeah, that's I do, what I that's do. what I want to hold. Sorry, yeah. Is I know you're writing scripts. I know you want to do other kind of programs. Mm-hmm. In the next few years, what do you want for yourself? The Mary Kate and Ashley ambitious child, now adult. What do you want in the in the years ahead? Is that too sincere? No, because I have an actual answer, but I don't even think I'm gonna say it. Because I <laughs> Um, my honest answer is I want to fall in love. <laughs> that, that's actually what I want. Is I feel like I have everything else. More than anything. I honestly just feel like I have everything else. And that's why I want it because it's the one thing I don't have. I feel like it would also balance my life out a bit more if I every everything wasn't about like my career or like what I want to do like what do I want to do in the next five years like I've constantly been having to think about that always like what do you want to do next what do you want to do next what's the next thing like I kind of would just like to I don't know just see how things go well I'm not saying that I will I'm always working on new things but yeah I would like to meet someone what do you think is the roadblock to you falling in love like if that's really where you want to go with this I don't know but then also now I just feel like this is it's just I shouldn't it's unnecessary I don't know (laughs) (laughs) no I don't I don't want to get into what the roadblock is right now well but if we put it out here then you'll be free of it I don't know what the roadblock is okay if I knew then that would be great information what else do I want to do I want to um learn to dance you're thought, a great dancer. Oh, thank you. Sorry, that was just me fishing for compliments. You're such a good dancer. I know I am. It's so true. I saw you do the cha-cha dance. I like that yeah, dance. Yeah, yeah, I love that. I try to do it. I'm not as good. No, that's fine. Not everyone has as naturally gifted as me. You want to make a show? Yeah, like I would love to... Gen um, Z Skins or yeah, something like that. Yeah, I would, I would love to put 
like be creative, like to car- carry on like being an exec producer on things, like to direct something, um, writing scripts. Like there's so many things I would love to do like within the entertainment industry. And like- Amy Poehler like. Yeah, like I would I would love I would love that. That's what I would love to do and I'm I'm trying, but it's just so much harder when you have to wait for people to commission you. That is what I found and that's why I love YouTube because you don't have to wait. Mm. And um I don't think that I would be here to like with talking to you about my career and all the things that I had done if I had to wait to be commissioned because that like they either have 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 said no or they would find a way to make it into something that it didn't feel like it was authentic to me so yeah i'm now going to go into this new stage of life where um i need to wait for people to say yes and let's see how that goes well whenever they do say yes i hope that you can still make work that sounds and feels like you yeah, I think it's definitely possible, isn't it? It has to be. It is. Surely. And also, maybe I can carry on making my own work on my own terms, on my own platforms. I hope so. Yeah. That's the way forward, right? That's what the kids are doing. Ten years of doing this show, I just want to say, now I'm going to be sincere. It is it is moving and impressive that you've hung on to the thing and didn't compromise mm-hmm. along the way. And um, really, I congratulations on that. Um, as someone who's been doing this for a really long time, mm. it's hard to do. Thank you. And I wish you love as well. Thank you. I'm welling up. This is the this is like the British version of welling up, right? I'm welling up. I, I'm completely, my face hasn't moved, but I'm definitely welling up inside. Is that true? No. Okay. But I appreciate that. Thank you. And thank you for having me. And it's been a, a, a wild ride. Amelia, nice to meet you. I don't want to leave. You want to stay? Yeah, but I have to go. You want the day to continue? Yeah, we yeah, it could continue, but not in here. Like as in I have to leave, actually. Okay. Okay. It's been great. That's the end. Goodbye. <laughs> Thank you. Thank you.